And this idea is known as the Helmholtz machine. And the general idea of the Helmholtz machine is that we want to fit a directed generative model to the data set. And we want to use maximum likelihood for it. But we all know that in general, training directed models with many latent variables is a hard problem and in general intractable. So the basic idea with the, with the Helmholtz machine is to use a secondary system, um, an inference network that runs from the observed data up to the latent variables, we call it Q, that is somehow trained to help us do approximate inference. And um, so the rest of this talk I will use P to denote the generative network that goes from the prior over multiple latent variables down to the observed data, and use Q um, also as a multi-layer neural network with latent variables that goes from the observed data up to the latents. Um, so besides of the early, wake on, uh, early work on wake sleep, which was introduced in the mid-90s, there's recently been a great explosion of work related to training Hellman's machines. And this includes, for example, the variation, variational autoencoder um, and also the work on stochastic backpropagation for approximate inference that both work with continuous latent variable, variables and that were introduced in uh, 2014. But this also includes uh, neural variational inference and the DARN models that were specifically for discrete binary uh, latent units. So the basic theme about all these models is that all of them um, rely on a variational approximation to um, essentially obtain uh, expression that contains both the inference network Q and the generative network P into a common joint objective function. And um, so this, unfortunately, this, this common joint objective function cannot be naively um, trained using samples from Q because it turns out that it was, this would result in very high variance estimators. So that is probably one of the reasons why it took nearly 20 years to come up with better, better mod models and methods to train Helmholtz machines. Um, so in this work, we do not use variational approximation to train our models, but we will derive the parameter update equations only using important sampling as kind of the basic mechanism. And important sampling has been used before to evaluate already trained models. So in the literature, um, we see different approaches to evaluate a trained model. So we are given a generative model P and a proximate inference um, model Q. And we can interpret the approximate inference model Q as a proposal distribution and obtain an estimator that gives us a reasonable good likelihood estimate given a test set data point. Um, so this is the, the estimator that we obtain when we just follow the path. And so let me, let me note a few properties of this estimator. So first, of, first, this is an unbiased estimator for the likelihood. It's not an unbiased estimator for the log likelihood, but it's an unbiased estimator for the likelihood. And the variance of this estimator critically depends on the quality of, on, the, on the proposal distribution Q. So in general, what we need is that the proposal distribution gives us samples that cover the whole pro the um, high probability region from the joint, from the generative joint of our model. Um, what is also interesting is that in the case that oh, so we can minimize the variance of this estimator when our proposal distribution Q approximates the uh, true untractable posterior P of H given X from our generative model. What is interesting in the extreme case, in the unlikely case, that we would have an um, approximate inference model that exactly is exactly equal to the exact posterior P of H given X, we actually have a zero variance estimator. So in other words, in this case, if we take a single arbitrary sample from our proposal distribution Q, what we get is a perfect estimate of the um, likelihood P of X. Um, so while this estimator was used before, um, what we here propose is to use the same basic mechanism of important sampling to also derive the parameter update rules for our model. Um, so if we do this and we write down the parameter update rules for our generative model P using Q as a proposal, 
we end up with an um, approximate or with a gradient estimator that looks like this. And let me maybe expand this a little bit and, and tell you about some properties of this. So this essentially tells us that to get a gradient for our generative model, uh, given a single training data set X, what we should do is we should draw K samples from our proposal distribution. And for each of these samples, we should calculate the importance weights, which essentially look like the ones you saw on the previous slide. And we also calculate, for each of these samples, we calculate the gradient for the generative model. And then we use the importance weights to essentially take a weighted average of all these different gradients for the different um, samples. Um, so it's, it's important to see here that actually we don't need any kind of backprop through our generative model. So we can here train the generative model using layer-wise targets. So each layer gets a local gradient because it is kind of a fully observed sample from the generator from the feedforward network queue. And I also want to point out that the uh, importance weights are automatically normalized to one. So this really essentially gives us that the overall gradient that we should use to train our generative model is just the weighted average over the individual samples that are weighted according to their um, usefulness of interpreting this data point. So while this gave us an intuitively interpretable update, a gradient update rule for the generative network P, there's no signal whatsoever how to train the feedforward uh, proposal network Q in this. And that's not really surprising because we use the proposal network Q only as a proposal network for our estimators. And as such, the proposal Q doesn't have any influence on the expected values of our estimators. It doesn't have any influence on the expected log likelihood and it doesn't have any influence on the expected gradients. But it has an influence on the variance of these estimators. So a natural choice how we want to train our inference network seems to be we want to minimize the variance of our estimators. We want to have good estimators for gradients and for the log likelihood. So what we do here is we train Q to minimize the variance of our estimators, which essentially means that we train Q to approximate the untractable posterior P of H given X, which kind of seems intuitively. So there's still one choice to make, and that is um, what X should be training Q. And here we have two obvious choices um, that we could think of. There might be more. But one is we could train Q to minimize the variance for the data points from our training data set. Or we could train Q to minimize the variance for the data points that the generative model could imagine, or that the generative model thinks is true. So we will call the one update the wake phase update that uses training data to train Q and the one that uses imaginary data from um, our generative model is called sleep phase, related to the original back sleep. So for both of these approaches, we can easily derive gradient updates. And for the sleep phase Q update, this is very simple. It actually turns out that we have to sample a single sample from our generative network P and just use the sample as a target for our um, proposal distribution Q. For the wake phase Q update, we can use the same mechanism that we used before, important sampling, to derive gradients for our um, importance, for, sorry, for our proposal distribution Q. And it turns out, if you do the math, that the um, estimator of the optimal gradient has the very same structure as the same gradient estimator that we already derived for P. Um, so this is very convenient and, and uh, for practical perspective this is very convenient because this essentially means that if we want to train both P and Q, we take an example from our training set, um, we use Q to get proposals, we calculate the importance weights for both, uh, for, we calculate the importance weights for these proposals, we then use the same importance weights to train both, to average both the Q updates and the P updates. Um, 
Before showing some empirical results, I quickly want to mention um, the relationship to the original fake sleep and also to the other variational approximations. So it turns out if we look closely at the um, Q update equations on the previous slide, we would see that we what we're essentially doing is, or what, what these, these actually show is they are equivalent to minimizing the KL divergence between the true untractable posterior P of H given X and our proposal distribution Q. While whenever we use a variational approximation to derive a Helmholtz machine like structure, um, we typically at least get um, uh, update equations for Q, for Q where the Q is the reference distribution. So it's a KL diverg divergence between Q and P that gets optimized. Um, so this was one point. The original wake sleep algorithm was criticized for um, optimizing the KL divergence with the P on, as a reference. And that was because it was derived or justified using a, a variational approximation. So here we see that if we justify and derive um, reweighted wake sleep based on important sampling that we get it's the very same update rules and here we have kind of a, a reason why they sh should look this way. Another thing I just want to mention is that um, in the light of, of the scale divergence that if we take only k equal one sample and if we um, only do sleep phase updates that um, we essentially get the very same algorithm as a classical wake sleep algorithm from the 90s. Um, okay, some empirical results. So first, we ran on a variety of um, test sets. So we always use, for these experiments, we always use binary stochastic units as latent variables. And um, the layers in our P and Q networks were sigmoid belief layers. And so we noticed across all the data sets that we tried, using five to 10 samples is usually enough to get significantly better results in the classical wax sleep algorithm and to get results that approach state-of-the-art results. Um, we also noticed that across all data sets and consistently we get the best results if we do both sleep learning and keep learning for them, which means we have two different update tools to update our uh, inference network. Um, and we can easily do that. And um, this general strategy actually works to train relatively deep, works to train relatively deep network on uh, real world data sets like MNIST. So for example, when we train a five, six layer network um, with, uh, on, on the binarized MNIST data set, we get a test set log likelihood of roughly 85.5, which is um, competitive at least with state of the art models. Um, yeah, I, we did more experiments to show the, the sensitivity to the number of samples. I don't think I have enough time to go get into this, so we'll just finish here. This was developed from a machine learning perspective, and I think calculating importance weights is something that nature probably doesn't do um, directly. And I cannot make a strong statement about that. Um, but so for me, the motivation with this was actually to combine a fast forward inference method with a generative network. And this general architecture, that's an old idea, seems to make a lot of sense. Um, so it seems a bit sad that about a few years ago there was not so much work going on with this Helmholtz machine kind of architecture. So I realize that's not your motivation, but it strikes me that it is more biologically plausible than what you're saying. Yeah. Because if you take the biological model, you're going to have to do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the, so the, I think one of the important parts is here that we never train with backcrops, so we always get layer-wise gradients. Um, 
So of course, if we would use more complex layer models, we could use top there, but that's now a more complicated architecture. Uh, do, do, do comparisons to the variational methods that you were talking about, the you know, the paper and the paper? Um, yes, it's partially a bit, it's not so obvious to do all these computations because um, variation autoencoders, for example, use um, continuous latent variables. But we generally see that for binarized MNIST, at least, um, this method is very competitive compared to these other methods. In terms of speed as well as accuracy? Um, so we here need to take 5 to 10 samples. So that will slow down the process by a factor of 5 to 10. Um, compared to the methods that I mentioned for binary variables, like ENVIL, for example, Neural Variational Inference and Learning, um, these methods need an additional um, MLP, which estimates the baselines. Uh, so in my experiments, it was not completely clear how to parameterize these, so I cannot really say how this compares up to an exact factor, but it should be roughly maybe a factor of two slower because we need five samples, and there you would need a second pass only. But, so. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.